About a year and a half ago, uh, I fell in love. I fell in love with uh, an inanimate object that animated music in a way that I'd never heard before. It's uh, a loudspeaker um, that I bought for my hi-fi. I've since bought three sets of these loudspeakers, which is why I've traveled from Edinburgh down to West Sussex today to Harbeth loudspeakers who have been going for 40 years to find out why I think these are the best loudspeakers in the world. So it's a real honour to be uh, invited in to see uh, where the magic is made. And I'm here today with Alan at Harbeth Speakers. And um, what is your role here? Well, for 30 years, I've been designing loudspeakers that uh, seem to find a market, right. uh, and a growing market, actually, um, amongst people who, who care about the subtleties of sound. You know, it, it amazes me when I go to hi-fi exhibitions just how hard and harsh mm -hmm. so many loudspeakers are yeah. these days. And... Uh, it's a kind of rigid sound, isn't it, that seems to yeah, be... Yeah, the, the, the connection with, the, the, you know, how instruments really sound, it seems to have been lost. And so, uh, was Harbeth part of the BBC, part of this consortium? How, how did it all start? Mm, well, what the BBC found was, uh, particularly in the area of loudspeakers and mixing consoles and so on, that the technical standard of equipment made for the home user just wasn't good enough for the professional user. Mm -hmm. And uh, they decided they'd set about um, building their own. And one of the areas that they became, or two of the areas they became expertise, experts in, were microphones mm -hmm. and loudspeakers, both transducers. One at the front end of the recording process sure. and one at the back end of the process. So um, having developed skills in, in particularly in the loudspeaker area, um, when our founder reached retirement age in the BBC in research department, he thought to himself, hmm, I think I'll set up as a loudspeaker manufacturer. Yeah. And that's how Harbeth came into existence. Right. Absolutely fascinating. So you've been going for 40 years Correct. and you've been involved for... 30 years. Incredible. And, and, and what is your... You, you actually design the speakers mm. and it's... It goes, you know, there is a lineage. There is, yeah. That goes back a long way. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I'm highly respectful of engineers that, that came before me mm -hmm. because the fundamentals of how to make a, a natural sounding loudspeaker were perfected. The, the philosophy was perfected at the BBC because they had the enormous advantage that they could create a loudspeaker, position it in the control room, put performers the other side of the glass, and meander between listening to the performer and into the control room, listening to the reproduced sound over the loudspeaker. And that's not something that you can do in industry because you'd have to find some space, you'd have to hire some musicians. It's a very complicated and costly business. But in, in, in broadcasting, you've got talent kicking around who you can, you know, for a beer, a pint and a pint, you can persuade them to come in and perform. Mm -hmm. And... Um, that process of being able to compare the live and reproduced is very much core to, to what we do, but you wouldn't find that necessarily in many other speaker well, brands. The extraordinary thing for me is, is our, I kind of bought a pair of your speakers by mistake. It was a, I was fulfilling a certain specific set of requirements, and one was that the tweeters weren't on display because I have young children. <laughs> and it is like uh, you cannot have a young child in the same room as a tweeter and not have that tweeter pushed mm. in by the end of the day. Mm. Um, so I listened to them, I loved them, but it wasn't until I got them home and I was listening to quite a lot of classical music, and then I put on a Beyonce album and I just went, hang on a minute, what are they, what's going on here? I just felt there was something very different about them. Mm. And in, in a way that I absolutely loved, there was a, a warmth, a punch, the top end was, you know, beautiful and it suited the vinyl that I was playing and all of that stuff. And I, I guess that's the reason I'm here is to find out why, why they feel so different to other speakers. Mm. Well, you see, most of the artefacts of, of loudspeakers that you, you read about in reviews, um, you know, the negative comments such mm -hmm. as spitty, wiry, brittle, aggressive, sharp, um, zingy and so on. These are self-evidently manifestations of, um, of a created product because the human voice box and, uh, and chest cavity and so on does not 
produce hard, brittle, sharp, zingy, ringy, because this is a well-damped, well-nourished system. It's elastic and so on. So if you hear those artefacts in reproduced sound, your subconscious mind, your subconscious says to you, this is a, this is a man-made product. I, I've never heard in 20 million years of evolutionary development, my auditory system has never heard a voice that sounds harsh like that. Right. The problem the industry has is there's such a disconnection between voice, speech, and the quality reproduction of it, um, and the fantastic design tools that we have now that um, designers seem to have gone off in a, in a peculiar sort of direction, and they've lost that, um, that uh, reference back to the original source. But it's very easy to prove. We, we, we agree between, between us which one of us is going to be the guinea pig. We go outside with a, a good microphone. We right. record that person under still wind, windless conditions. We bring the recording back, we sit the person down, we put a loudspeaker next to them and we say, okay, speak, and they retell, retell their life story in a couple of minutes. Okay, enough. Now we listen to the reproduced sound. You can hear immediately the differences. Right. And we're trying to narrow the differences such that, you know, the harshness and the wiriness and those sort of artificial, um, you, you know, artifacts are, are eliminated. So what you're saying is, as a, as a reference point, you, you, you tend to focus on the voice because it's, it's more abstract with a large orchestra to go, well, the, the oboe's kind of pinging out, and I don't know if that's the recording or... That's, that's right. Right. Yeah. I mean, everything in, in, in the, the recorded world is post-processed. Right. You know, EQ'd. Yeah. Um, compressed, expanded, width-adjusted. Width yeah. Um, and it, 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 we don't know as casual listeners how much of that post-production mm -hmm. has gone on. So our frame of reference using music as a primary source is already suboptimal. Yeah. But if we use speech, uh, we can, we can sub-select the hundred loudspeakers we, we, we've, we, we've lined up. We can whittle that down to 10 that sound credible, um, you know, in an hour. Right without involving the complexity and the emotion of listening to music. Then, as phase two, when we've got the 10 subset, we might be very well advised to listen to music. Well, I guess any punter can tell when you're holding your hand in front of your voice that there's something, there's something altering mm. that effect, mm. isn't there? So I guess that it makes total sense. Mm. But it's very unusual to find speaker, even reviewers, who would play speech over their loudspeakers, which right. is a great pity because they would hear things immediately. Uh, that Just on a human level. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so you've got some very intriguing looking yeah, books here. I've collected this stuff for 30 years. Wow. You know? um, these, so these log books represent the history of Harbeth. And I think right. we're up to number eight now. Amazing. But if I go back to number one, which was the very first time I encountered Dudley Harwood. Right. And, and I was looking for this massive corporation because Harwood was such a, uh, a world-renowned audio engineer that I assumed that his business, Harbeth Loudspeakers, would be, you know... Not a garage. Not a garage. <laughs> um, and there he was, sitting in his office, and uh, I came away from there uh, because I was working for a Japanese company at the time. Mm -hmm. And when he told me that he um, was supplying Japan, I thought, well, I know how fussy the Japanese are. If this product from this lock-up garage is satisfying Japanese consumers, it must have something going for it. I was very, very lucky in that my first speaker, the HL Compact, became Component of the Year in Japan in 1988. Wow. And that really set us on the path. And is that a predecessor of the HL15? The, the Super HL5? Yeah, HL5? H5, sorry. Its predecessor okay. was that, which in fact was the same dimensions as Harwood's last speaker, the Mark IV. Interesting. Because I have those as my kind of, my secondary Harbeth uh, pair, and I, they're, I'm, they, abs they have a staggering um, obviously, the, the Super HL5s, they have a staggering uh, kind of bass response and for the size. And it, you, you were thinking that, you were saying that the, the dimensions... Yeah, there, there's something about that 
as in old money, we would say two cubic foot box, you know, 12 inches, 12 inches, 24 inches. Right. There's something about that space, acoustic space, which which is a bit magical. Okay. Yeah. We're many generations on now, but of course we've kept the same proportions and it does seem to work. Absolutely. In fact, I've actually got here the, um, the actual original uh, design notebook of what was then called the Mark V and became the HL5. So this goes back to 1988 and I'm very careful about documenting on a an hour by hour basis where I'm at with the design. Right. Um, it gives you a it gives you confidence that you have considered everything when arriving at your final uh, your final product. And I've kept this up. So, um, for example, another book is the um, many years later, two thousand and six. This is the five inch drive unit for the P three, our smallest loudspeaker, logbook number two, and um, you know, it's a lot of very carefully considered small incremental observations about, um, you know, how the thing behaves and trying to balance the forces because loudspeakers are all about compromises. And tell me about the, the manufacture of the speakers because you make the components, many of the components here, is that correct? We do, yes. Um, we were sort of driven into it actually because right. we couldn't buy from uh, commercial suppliers drive units of, of a high enough quality. Right. And um, we wanted that kind of liquid um, clarity in the middle frequencies which you'll know about. Mm -hmm. And if you buy box standard woofers and bog standard tweeters, you can't really expect too much clarity. Okay. So yeah, we're driven into it. Would you like to have a look? Yes, please. Absolutely fantastic. So ex excuse my, my ignorance, but uh, we may have to go back to the beginning and talk about what a driver is. <laughs> <laughs> OK. What a driver is. In common parlance, a woofer is a low frequency um, uh, sound producing motor system right. and a tweeter is a high frequency yes. sound producing system. What is uh, often forgotten is that the material, normally plastic, that the woofer cone is made from really defines the sound of the entire speaker, the material. Not, wow. not necessarily the shape or, or whatever, but the material. Um, I mean, it, it, an analogy would be, imagine making a violin out of chipboard. Yes. Now, in your mind, you can hear a dead, dull, uh, lifeless sort of sound, can't you? you yeah. Know, you can, well, it's that sort of issue with, with loudspeaker cones. So the conventional way that speakers are made is to get a, a sheet of um, plastic, yep. such as this, and to drape it over a mould tool, mm -hmm. such as this, very inexpensively made. So you drape that over there, you put an electric heater this side of it and a vacuum on the bottom side and you suck the film down onto the cone and you end up with something that looks like that. Okay. And then you take a pair of scissors you cut off the surplus and you've got yourself a cone. OK. Incredibly cheap, very attractive to the speaker industry because it requires very little technology and it produces a, a very cheap product. The problem is that um, what you end up with with a polypropylene cone is something that has no stiffness at all. Right. It's, it's really the wrong solution. What you want is a cone that is injection molded that wow. has actually got rigidity and stiffness to it. And to do that, you need to do some proper engineering research. Okay. And we got quite a large government grant to help us to, to ease us into this technology. So. And is that a unique thing to? Yes. yes really? Yes. Wow. Yes. And I'm very surprised, you know, you talked about the chipboard violin and stuff. How important is the box? Is it really about the, the actual drivers more than the no, box? It, it, the fundamental sound is that of this material or this material or, or this material. OK. One of the issues with polypropylene, it, it, it's very smooth. No, no one would ever complain about that. But it's got this slight fogging effect. Um, so that uh, it, it just sounds, if I had a tie and I put my tie over my mouth, it would just take away the the crispness of sound. It's still okay. clearly intelligible and it's still clearly me, but it hasn't got that air 
And the reason is that the molecules in this polypropylene material um, are in a sort of waxy state where they rub against each other, which is why it's so flexible. Okay. And as they do that, they convert the very low level tonal detail into heat. And once it's heat, it's lost as sound. Okay. So what you need if you want to reproduce those tonal details is something that's much more rigid so that the molecules can't slide against each other. They're held in a matrix together. Right. So is this kind of stage one in a life cycle of a Harbeth speaker? It is. What you do first is uh, you assemble the voice coil onto the, uh, the suspension. Okay. And then you offer the suspension up to the, the basket, as it's called, with a, a, a centering tool to make sure it's absolutely spot on. And then, um, actually we've got uh, the smaller ones in production today, but that's a P3. Uh, cone and surround as a sub-assembly. So that would be fitted out with a voice coil at that stage and then would be offered up. Like and this so. is all done by hand? Yeah, yeah. We can do this because we've been doing it for 30, 25 years. We can do this to a higher standard than we can buy, could buy in parts. Really? Yeah. So our problem is not uh, the control of this process, it's making sure the tweeter manufacturers, who supply us, mm -hmm. actually meet the quality standards that we have internally for woofers. Right. It's quite a challenge. I bet. And how do you keep that quality? The first and most important factor is you keep the staff. Mm -hmm. People here have been working here for 18 years, 15 years, 12 years. I don't think there's anybody less than five or six years. Mm -hmm. So you keep the skill set in the people that you work with. Right. That's the first factor of quality control. And secondly, we, we, we have a standard solution that we use in uh, across the product line. So we're not making lots of variants and complicated, exotic, uh, you know, adjustments. It's a standard, you know, design, mm -hmm. which is um, which is stable and, and well understood. Brilliant. So what's the next bit? Well, the next bit after we've assembled the complete speaker up is to, a uh, complete woofer up, is to test it. Right. Come and have a look. It's brilliant. I've just had a, one of those funny feelings. Uh, it, it reminds me of a memory I have as a kid mm. that they used to shoot the Muppets in Twickenham Studios. Okay. And my mother took us to see the Muppets being shot. Mm -hmm. And then they took us on a tour backstage mm -hmm. afterwards. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And myself and my brother burst into tears because basically the whole place was covered in dead Muppets. <laughs> and this is, it, it's like this place is full of dead harbours. It's really quite no, disturbing. No, no, they're not dead. <laughs> they're, 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 they're in the, the process of this creation. Is, this is the birthing chamber. <laughs> That's right. It's a bit abstract. <laughs> <laughs> so the testing. <laughs> in this area here, we have a dual function test system. The woofers that we made next door are put into this uh, box here. So, for example, the Monitor 40.2 reference unit, which looks like this, mid-range in a Monitor 40, would be put into... That's the one I've got, isn't yep, it? That would be put into there, hooked up, and the system calibrated. And all the production from the production department would be passed through here one by one, and measurements taken off the screen and then we are completely certain about the strength of the magnet and the frequency sure. response and so on. And is there a certain tolerance? We don't really like that word tolerance. Okay. Um, we've got this down to such a fine art now that we can produce these within a tiny fraction of a decibel. So in the sense that you ha uh, that, 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 that those micro decibels, you, you match things up, That's is that right? right? Yes, right. yes, yes. Uh, the, the, when we have um, selected uh, the drive units, uh, the, the, the woofers, we will match them to corresponding tweeters. Right. So, I mean, what it, we do for the left speaker, we must also do for the right. I see. Um, yeah. Oh, so that's where you get the kind of the idea of ma matching from. Yeah. So it's not only the veneer, it's actually the drive units are matched together in one speaker and as a pair. Right. Uh, actually, there's four levels of matching because this equipment has two functions. It can be switched from testing drive units mm -hmm. to testing crossovers. OK, and you'll have to explain to me what a crossover is. OK, well, it's a circuit board which takes a signal from your hi-fi amplifier, mm -hmm. divides it up between the woofer and tweeter and super tweeter, if it has one, and filters out high frequencies from getting to the woofer and low frequencies from getting to the tweeter. We 
choose to test not only the drive units but also the crossovers as well. So they are clipped onto this board like so with a big clamp and wired out to the connectors and sitting on the screen here. In fact actually that is a real um, that's a real example. The yellow dotted line is the reference. Wow. And the green <laughs> is the actual specimen, the last specimen that that's was tested. That's insane. Yeah. So that they're, they're, they're very, very closely matched. That's incredible. I think the thing that I'm finding quite daunting is the minute, say, for example, with a pair of 40.2s, you've got your three speakers and then your crossovers. Mm -hmm. It's like an almost infinite number of minute tweaks that must happen when you're developing these mm. things. How do you do it without just having to build loads of loudspeakers mm. and when you're developing them? Well, actually, uh, I was talking to uh, 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 another speaker designer recently right. because I, 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 you know, I'm, uh, I'm working alone. I'm not, there isn't a team here. You right. know, it's, 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 it's you know, my responsibility. So I don't get a lot of interaction with other speaker designers, but when I do and I ask them about their methodology, I'm really astonished how, how advanced we are here. There are plenty of designers who would sit with a bucket of components and a circuit board and they would reach into the bucket. E even today, 2017, they'd reach wow. into the bucket, solder it on, do a measurement, do a bit of listening, think, mm, no, I'll change that. Right. And they go around that iterative process until yes. they get bored. I've been using simul simulation CAD software for nearly 30 years and you can be sure that the end product is the result of every conceivable permutation um, that your creativity will allow. It's the best possible outcome of all the variables. Right. Uh, and I can't understand why speaker designers don't universally use CAD software because sitting on the beach with a pina colada, um, you know, on a lovely sunny day with a laptop, you can be sure that you have explored every possible outcome, which is not what happens when you have a pile of bits. It depends how deep you reach, what's in the bucket, how bored you get. Suboptimal. I'm going to have to work this pina colada beach laptop thing into into sample development. It sounds like a really good, the way forward. It, it's only a theory. It's only a theory. I've never actually done that. But believe me, it's very attractive as an idea. That's brilliant. So you've got your your uh, manufactured um, drivers here, yeah. and then I guess they go into well, they go into speakers. Do you want right. to see that? Yes, please. We start with a baffle which is a fancy word for the front board, onto which we mount the super tweeter, um, the main tweeter and the woofer. They're paired up so that they have complementary characteristics. And then they, in turn, or the baffle, is offered to the cabinet. Right. Now, not only are the drive units matched, but the veneers are matched, so that that matches that. Right. And how much does the, the cabinet affect the sound and the material of the, the cabinet? Well, clearly it's a factor, isn't it? Um, the BBC's philosophy, which, which I uh, absorbed and, and, and have yet to disprove, is that if we accept that the cabinet is part of the sound, let's work with that. Mm -hmm. Let's not kid ourselves that we can make, uh, or if we do make a cabinet that is so you know, infinitely rigid that um, it, that is somehow going to going to yield a better sound. All the cabinet does is store energy. If we store energy in part of the spectrum, the audio spectrum, where it is um, particularly objectionable, mm -hmm. then even the tiniest movement in the cabinet is going to ring. Conversely, the BBC said, let's move all of the, let's make the boxes relatively um, uh, lightweight but very well damped and then we can move all of the problems right down in the audio spectrum where they are well away from the mid-band and we can have that super clean mid-frequency. So it's a different philosophy. Yeah, it's absolutely fascinating. So uh, I'm familiar with these guys but I've just spotted this. Ah oh, yes. <laughs> my, my, my colleagues, my marketing colleagues said we need to celebrate our 40th year. 
and we need to do it in style. Yeah. And if we're going to do it in style, let's do it lavishly. So we came up with this series of 40th anniversary loudspeakers. And we've oh. created this special limited edition, new badges, exotic terminals, slight improvement in the sound. And that went so well, we said, OK, let's do, let's do something else. And uh, the something else became the silvered eucalyptus monitor 30.2s. Wow. wow. We have a name for this. Mm -hmm. Divorceware. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's all my fault, then, is yeah, it? Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> I already have three sets of Harbeths, and I don't think I can uh, I can stretch. Oh, you can, you can. <laughs> um, something that I've been kind of touting about, been visiting a lot of students, and I've been, it's our tenth anniversary year this year, oh, really? and so we've been all around the world meeting users and making new friends and mm -hmm. and stuff. And something that I talk about where, where music's concerned is fifty percent of what we do is sound sonics mm -hmm. and fifty percent of what we do is feeling mm -hmm. and you know when people talk about you know comparing this speaker to that speaker this sound to that sound this unit to that unit the one thing I say is obviously listen to it and, and hear you know understand what your ears are telling you but for me I just say to people how does it make you feel does mm -hmm. that resonate at all with you where, where manufacturing speakers is concerned I I have to try and remove the emotional element mm -hmm. from from um, from from the design process mm -hmm. because you can you can get seduced by your own creation and that's very dangerous. Sure. Um, I mean, for example, I if I'm really uncertain about some something and I'm past the the speech testing and I'm at the music st stage, I'll actually play music backwards over the speakers because it breaks the emotional connection. Um, so I have to really guard against getting, getting you know, emotionally involved with the design. I'm trying. I'm leaving for that for you. All that. Well, that's what's interesting. All that um, you know, pleasure is passed on to the customer. You know, you start that process, that journey. But I guess what I'm trying to decode is why someone like me gets on a plane from Edinburgh to come down to, to feel so much passion. And I understand, and I get a sense that you have passionate. Mm. Users. I really care. We all care. You know? yeah. yeah. Well, maybe the passion it, that you have in its manufacture uh, uh, is translated into a feeling people have I th when I they listen so. to. I think so. Yeah. I mean, this is a this is a lifetime commitment to producing products that that endure. And we have customers using forty year old Harbeths. We know. Yeah. Um, it, and it's also it's also environmentally right. It, you know, th these products are built to last. We're cutting down a tree. Yeah, that's the end of that tree's existence as a, a, a as a as a natural uh, thing, and we're converting it into another another product. It's right that that product should last for forty, fifty years, whatever, and and therefore I design with longevity in mind. Uh, we want these products to outlive us, you know, because mm. they're expensive. You yeah, know, if you're going to make an investment in them, yep. you deserve to get, you know, a decent lifetime's use out of them. Well, if I was a tree, that would be the way I'd want to <laughs> Take go. Take you on a go. <laughs> yeah. Alan, thank you so much That's for your time. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you Cheers. very much. Excellent.